Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people or people who are experts in various topics pertaining to spirituality. Um, I have done hundreds of these programs now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, <clears throat> and check under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to support it in any amount, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. Um, my guest today is Mark Gober. I met Mark um, last October at the Science and Non-Duality Conference. I was excited to see the title of the presentation he was going to give, um, An End to Upside Down Thinking dispelling the myth that the brain produces consciousness and the implications for everyday life, which is also the title of his book. And so I attended his presentation and enjoyed it, talked to him afterwards, and we made arrangements to do this interview, which we're now going to do. Um, I was thinking about the interview, and I'd, I'd like to just read a little something I wrote. I don't want to pretend that I'm saying this extemporaneously, but um, it's something I'd like to just read out as a preface to our discussion. Um, our understanding of how the world works has a major impact on how we influence it. If we still thought the Earth was the center of the solar system, we wouldn't have gotten to the moon, we wouldn't have satellites, modern communications, etc. If we still thought the Earth was flat, we wouldn't be able to navigate the oceans. If we didn't believe germs existed because you can't see them, we wouldn't have modern hygiene and medicine. In each of these examples, and many more, those entrenched in the existing paradigm resisted the introduction of new knowledge. People were ridiculed, tortured, and killed for espousing it. Church authorities threatened to put Galileo on the rack if he didn't recant his assertion that the Earth orbited the sun, and they refused to look through his telescope. Um, Mark argues in his book, and we'll, as we'll be discussing, and, and he's in agreement with many time-honored spiritual traditions, as well as many leading physicists, that consciousness is fundamental to the universe. This view contradicts the predominant materialistic scientific paradigm, predominant today. Since modern science and the technologies it spawns are the predominant influence in our world, if science is wrong about what consciousness is and how it fits into the scheme of things, how has this error impacted our world? And how might, how might the world change if science correctly understands consciousness? So that's the bit that I wrote. Now I just want to read a little quote from Mark's book, which answers the question I just asked. How might the world change if science correctly understands consciousness? And here it is. This is Mark writing. I, believe, I view the belief that we are finite and separate to be the disease underlying virtually every problem in human society today. Anxiety, depression, interpersonal problems, racial and social prejudices, gender inequality, geopolitical unrest, violence, war, greed, or nearly every problem you can think of at their core are symptoms, not the disease. The world's problems are caused at the most fundamental level by the pervasive underlying assumption that we are all finite, limited, and separate. And that stems from the materialist belief that consciousness comes from the brain. So, here we go. Thanks, Mark, and hello. Hi, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. I've been looking forward to this interview for a long time. I read your book back in December because I was eager to read it. And uh, I, think, um, I think we're both, and hopefully our audience, are really going to enjoy this conversation. Um, so before we really get into it, just tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. My background on the surface doesn't have much to do with consciousness. Um, I, I work in the business world. I'm a partner at a firm called Sherpa Technology Group in Silicon Valley, and we advise businesses on their technology, business, and intellectual property strategy. Prior to that, I worked in investment banking with UBS in New York, and that I was there from two thousand. Switzerland is that what that is? UBS. It, it was originally that was the name, and then it became UBS. Okay. Um, and it was. Um, I was there from 2008 to 2010, so during the financial crisis. My first day was in July of 2008, and it was right before 
everything really got bad. Mm -hmm. And I, I was actually in the group that was responsible for advising financial institutions. So my clients were banks and insurance companies and asset managers. Yeah. So I got to see a lot of, of that world up close and personal. Prior to uh, investment banking, I was a, a student at Princeton University. Um, I was the captain of the tennis team there. So my focus in, in college was I, I was very focused on sports because it was a division one program and that kept me very busy. I ended up studying psychology and uh, focusing on behavioral economics. So I wrote my thesis on Daniel Kahneman's Nobel Prize winning prospect theory, which is about how people make decisions under risk. And he wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which summarizes a lot of what I studied in undergrad. Okay. Um, and so you probably weren't thinking much about the things that you describe in your book. So how did you shift from the, your primary focus uh, of finance and so on to writing this book? Well, now in hindsight, I think I've, I've had interests in, in big existential questions for a long time. And in college, I almost decided to major in astrophysics because I took a few intro courses and thought it was fascinating. And I wanted to understand our place in this big universe. But because of the tennis commitments, I wasn't able to do it. So I think the interests were always there. The topic of consciousness, though, didn't really enter. Um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big deal for me until around August of 2016 when I heard a podcast. And it was a show called Extreme Health Radio. I wasn't listening to learn about consciousness per se. I was just learning about health. And I heard a woman on that show who talked about psychic abilities and her ability to communicate with non-physical entities. And these were things that I had just never heard of. And at the end of that interview, the woman whose name is Laura Powers talked about her own podcast called Healing Powers, where she interviews other people that have had similar experiences. So I decided to listen to that podcast just because I thought it was cool. And I, uh, on my drive from San Francisco to our office, which is down in the peninsula, we can hit traffic. And so I just had a lot of time to listen to podcasts in the car. I ended up listening to all of the episodes of that podcast from 2016 all the way back to 2011 mm -hmm. in, over the course of a few weeks. And at that point, I, after having listened to so many different interviews, I, I was confronted with a problem because now I had a lot of independent accounts of things that I couldn't explain at all with my prevail with my worldview, which is a very conventional materialistic one. And here I was being presented with evidence that contradicted it. So I became very curious and I started to do research. And as I researched more and more and looked at the science and also um, worked with people that have these abilities as well and, and what they were able to do confirmed uh, what the research was showing, it really rocked me. It was an extremely disorienting period of a few months in late 2016 where I had to shift my worldview. And all I wanted to do at that point was to learn as much as I could because I wanted to understand the reality that I'm in. The way I think about the world is is how we derive meaning is, is ultimately based on our perception of reality and of who and what we what we think we are. So that's all I wanted to do. And I spent about a year just researching nonstop outside the office, pretty obsessively, books all over my apartment in San Francisco. And uh, after telling a few friends about what I was researching, because at first, in the communities that I'm in, these are totally foreign concepts. And to talk about psychic abilities and life after death, I mean, people would just stare at me at first. But as I started to tell people about the research that I was doing and that there was credible stuff out there, I, I got very positive reactions from people. And in fact, some people said that their lives were shifting in a positive direction as a result of our conversations. So I think the combination of that feedback with my intense passion for the material led me to say, why don't I try to put this down on paper? And at first I said, I said that to myself and then I said, no, I'm not going to do that. That's going to take forever. I have to cite all the sources if I want to do this right. I'm not, I'm not, I work in finance. I'm not going to do that. And then I, I actually had dinner with a few friends one night and they suggested, hey, Mark, why don't you try it? So I, I took the 4th of July weekend in 2017, which was a long weekend and ended up getting a good chunk of, of the book done that weekend, which then motivated me to finish the draft that month. And now here we are. Here we are. Um, Explain for a minute, I could explain this, but I'm sure you could explain it better. Um, what is a paradigm and what is a paradigm shift? A paradigm is a prevailing way of thinking about things and a shift is a, is a new way of thinking about that fundamental idea. What's interesting to me about this, this consciousness related paradigm is that we're talking about a paradigm that underlies other paradigms. And you were alluding to this in your introduction. The, the way we view reality will inform the way we 
act towards each other, the way we do science, the way we do medicine, the way we study things. So what we're talking about here in this conversation and my book discusses is a paradigm in, in terms of how we view reality. What is, what is our basic worldview? And there's a great book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. I'm sure you've read that, um, in which he talks about the process of paradigm shift. And again and again, um, you know, history shows that there is always a reluctance by those who are entrenched in the existing paradigm to shift out of it. They have vested interests and, um, and they give anybody who's proposing a new paradigm a really hard time, generally. <laughs> um, and yet, the, you know, if a paradigm is going to shift, it does so because there's more and more and more evidence um, challenging and refuting the existing paradigm. It really begins to get, you know, shaky and eventually a shift takes place and, you know, then that becomes the new paradigm, right? Is that a fair summary of that? Yeah, I think that's what we've seen historically. Yeah. And I wonder if we're at that point with, with regard to consciousness and reality. One thing I was thinking about in, in your case is, you know, was there something about the work you do in the financial world or something that made you more flexible and open-minded? Um, or if it's just your nature? I mean, you just happen to sort of have a more inquisitive <laughs> mind or something. That's a great question. I, I think it's probably both that I've tended to always ask questions and just be open to things because I, I know that I don't know that much and therefore I should be open to new possibilities. My whole life has shown me that just based on how much I've learned. It shows that at a certain point in time there was a lot that I didn't know. But professionally, it's interesting you ask that. I, I work a lot with intellectual property and helping companies license their intellectual property patent assets or acquire or do work on their business strategy around those assets. And a patent by definition is a new invention that is something novel and non-obvious relative to what's known as the prior art, what was done at the time. So every single patent is looking at a paradigm and doing something above it. So I, I think in some ways I've been trained to look at paradigm shifts and because I work with so many inventors and inventive companies, I may be a bit more acclimated to that. That's interesting. And you know, the, the real innovators in science and other fields have always been those who have thought outside the box, you know. Um, they weren't so constrained by the existing paradigm. paradigm. They, were, they were kind of renegades uh, in a way. I mean, you know, a lot of people look at what Einstein came up with in, as he was working in a patent office, actually, and they think, wow, where did he get that? That was just like so, so totally unexpected. But he had the sort of broadness of vision to, you know, come up with something radically new. That's a great point. I, I noticed that a lot with inventors we work with. Some of the best inventors are, are looking at things from a different perspective. And sometimes they'll come from out of the field that they're working in because they had a different background and they're using maybe a cleaner slate to look at an old problem. And they come up with a novel solution that is sometimes so simple that the status quo, those who are entrenched in that belief system will resist it. And in the patent world, that manifests itself through litigation. Mm -hmm where someone gets sued for patent infringement and there's resistance because there's an argument over who invented it first and whether that was actually a novel idea. So it is something that I see all the time. Yeah. I wonder if the resistance to paradigm change is, has, I mean, it obviously has something to do with human psychology, which you also studied at Princeton for a bit. Um, you know, I wonder if it's a, a kind of a fear thing that one feels that one's existence is threatened by, um, you know, the one that derives some, some, some sort of security by being, in a world that makes sense, you know, and if something begins to shake that world, you feel th you, you feel th personally threatened. Yeah, well, I can say that from personal experience. This was a, a threatening experience for me to challenge my worldview and realize that what I thought to be true was not correct or that it was just partially correct. And you're reminding me of a quote from an interview that I did recently for my forthcoming podcast. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a name yet, but it will be released uh, in 2019 at some point. I interviewed Brenda Dunn who co-ran the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab with Dr. Robert John, who was the former Dean of Engineering. They were studying anomalies of consciousness. And it's Brenda and I were talking about- Anomaly, okay. Yeah, so anomaly means something that doesn't fit the mainstream paradigm. So if we think the world works a certain way, a, an anomaly is a finding that doesn't fit with that. And there's been a tendency throughout history sometimes to just sweep those under the rug because they're not convenient to a, a modern theory. And, and before I give the, the example about Brenda, I'll, I'll give a historical example of this. Around 1900, Lord Kelvin, who was one of the major authorities in science globally, he, he said that 
basically all of science had been figured out except for two clouds. These were two anomalies in science that were just small things they couldn't figure out. They didn't match the conventional theory. Once those anomalies were solved, those little things, those two clouds, they turned into relativity theory and quantum physics, which are two of the most revolutionary theories in all of physics. So I think paying attention to anomalies is important. And the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, which again was run by the former Dean of Engineering there, which is significant to me because I have great respect for that engineering department. Uh, they were looking at anomalies of consciousness, which I'm sure we'll get into. What was fascinating to me was to hear Brenda Dunn's uh, recollection of the resistance that she faced, which is similar to what I've heard from many scientists. What she, what she told me that scientists would say to her in private is, Brenda, do you realize that if the things you're doing are real, then that would mean that everything that I've been doing in my career, that's all wrong. <laughs> yeah, right, dude. <laughs> I mean, sorry, sorry to break the news to you, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, 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 uh, this whole topic, for some reason, just fascinates me. I've been interested in it for years. I mean, another obvious an anomaly is the, you know, the astronomical one, where it was thought that the Earth was the center of the solar system. And with, with that being the prevailing understanding, the movements of the planets made no sense. You know, they kind of would stop and go backwards and go in little loops and all kinds of things. Um, and I don't know how those were brushed under the rug for as long as they were, but when, when we finally shifted to the understanding that the sun is the center, then all of a sudden we had these beautiful ellipses, you know, and everything kind of mathematically worked out properly. And we have, we have something going on in physics where there are incompatibilities that where it doesn't fit just like that. And the biggest one that people talk about is relativity theory and quantum physics, which I had just mentioned. These are two of the bi biggest, most important theories in understanding the physical reality that we're in, and yet they are incompatible when you apply them together. So physicists and, and philosophers even, people are trying to come up with a unified theory to be able to work with these theories that seem to work independently. But when you put them together, something is off. And now that I've done the research that I've done, I am very curious as to whether consciousness is something that needs to enter all of our paradigms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the, in the last couple of days, you and I both watched a video by uh, Dr. John Hagelin uh, positing whether consciousness is the unified field and vice versa. And one of the things I think he pointed out in that video is that um, resolution or unification tends to take place at more fundamental levels. So, for instance, we have the four fundamental forces, you know, strong, weak, gravity, and electromagnetism. And going more fundamentally, a couple of those, um, I guess it's uh, the weak and electromagnetic, electro get unified into one fundamental field or force. Um, and science, physicists have been striving to go even deeper and unite them all into a grand unified theory, which Einstein devoted most of his life to after his initial breakthroughs. Yeah, that is, it's, it's a big one for physicists. And it, it still amazes me to think that we don't have a unified theory to explain existence and physical reality we're in. So it's, it's great to see uh, videos like that where people are trying to integrate many of the findings of consciousness uh, with mystical traditions to come up with a unified theory of everything. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, as you may know, Max Planck and a bunch of the early um, physicists actually were students of Vedic wisdom and often would, you know, quote from it and so on. And there's a quote from Max Planck that I'll put up on the screen here. You won't be able to see it, but the audience can. He said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard uh, as existing postulates consciousness. Yeah, that, it's, that one, when I talk to people about this topic, it really shocks people when they hear names like Max Planck, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, and this was in 1931 that he said that. And that, that statement really summarizes the thesis of my book and, and of what many other people are saying, which is that the conventional view known as materialism, which says that the universe is fundamentally made of physical stuff that we call matter. When I say matter, I mean my table here is made out of atoms of matter, physical stuff. That's the basis of the universe that formed in this Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. Lots of atoms of matter everywhere. And then all of a sudden, because you have a big universe, you have pieces of matter that start to interact with each other. That randomness and chance tells us that will eventually happen. And that's called chemistry. So we start with matter, then we get chemistry. 
And then with enough random chemical reactions in a very large universe, chance says that we'll end up with a molecule that can replicate itself. And that's like DNA. Okay. So DNA, DNA leads to the evolution of a human species, which develops a brain, and then we develop consciousness. <laughs> so that's the conventional view. Matter creates consciousness. And here Max Planck is saying, no, I regard consciousness as fundamental, and I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. I want to unpack several of the points you just made, but um, before we do that, since you mentioned randomness, here's, here's a quote from Fred Hoyle, the astronomer. He said, the chance that higher life forms might have emerged in this way from randomness is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've probably heard that one. It's a great one. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, I'm biased because I've been kind of in the consciousness is fundamental paradigm for 50 years or more. Um, but it seems to me that any high school kid these days knows that matter isn't really material. I mean, you, you learn in high school that uh, you know, that which appears solid is really mostly empty space, and, and even the little bits that are supposedly material are, are just, you know, vibrating strings if you go even deeper. Um, so it's funny that since that's such a common knowledge to any reasonably educated person, the, the, the notion that solid ma matter actually exists and is the foundation of everything is still so predominant. It is, and I, and I think about that often. I wonder why that's the case, because like you say, it is a, it's a basic part of our education to learn that atoms are 99.99999% empty space. Mm -hmm. So as we look around our collective rooms right now or wherever we are, all of that stuff that is allegedly matter is mostly empty. And separately, we know from quantum physics that it's known as the observer effect. When you look at something, it behaves differently than when you're not looking, and that's an oversimplification, but that's basically what happens. So matter, what we call what we're calling matter when you're not looking at it it behaves like a wave of probabilities it's maybe here maybe there it doesn't have a definite location so this stuff that we are all seeing that we consider to be matter because that's what our eyes show us it's mostly empty and it's not even solid unless we're looking at it so it, it takes a few intellectual steps and i think that might be the difficulty that our common sense our perceptual systems like our eyes our ears our nose our mouth our skin everything, those, those sensory organs show us a, a world which we then interpret as being a certain way. We have to almost undo that interpretation and those extra steps I think can be difficult. Yeah, and obviously you have to respect what appears to be matter as matter. You know, you don't go stepping in front of buses thinking that they're just gonna pass right through you or something, even though there's actually a finite statistical probability that they might, but you don't take that chance <laughs> because the odds are not <laughs> in your favor. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. We do live in a world that is apparently material and there are material laws. So it is practical to view things as being solid. The thing is, though, when we're when we're looking at a, a picture of reality, we can't we can't use approximations. We need to look at an exact picture, whereas what our eyes show us, we know that is just an approximation using traditional physics. The electromagnetic spectrum, which is the spectrum of all types of light, we know that visible light is just a tiny, tiny fraction of all kinds of light. And that would include things like infrared or x-rays. Those are types of light that we can't even see with our eyes. So we just have to remember sometimes to stop for a second and say, wait, our eyes are just showing us a small sliver of reality. Sure. I mean, every time you use a cell phone, you're actually employing the electromagnetic field, the same field that enables you to see the cell phone. You're just, you're just um, accessing or using different frequencies of it. Exactly. And we know that they're there because our phones work. Yeah. So we know that there are invisible things acting that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so there's a number of threads we want to tie up here and, and you know, go more deeply into. Um, one is, uh, there's a whole lot of things in your book that we're going to get into that um, attempt to illustrate or demonstrate that there's something subtler than the material world that we perceive and that there are all kinds of phenomena that take place by virtue of that something, you know, such as telepathy or remote viewing or, you know, dogs that know when their owners are coming home or <laughs> all kinds of things like that. Um, so I guess let's probe into that a little bit and uh, there'll be some little side channels that we'll go off on as, as we do that. 
Um, but the reason that I thought of that question is that when we started talking about electromagnetism, I thought, well, what do some of the devil's advocate people say to you? Maybe they say, well, you know, maybe that it's the electromagnetic field that we're somehow accessing as, you know, transmitter receivers, and, and that would account for telepathy. And we don't have to jump to the conclusion that consciousness is fundamental. It could still be produced by the brain, and yet somehow the brain is able to um, tune into electromagnetic fields and thereby, you know, do these anomalous things. I have heard arguments like that, and for me it is the accumulation of these anomalies, these things that don't make sense under the conventional view, the accumulation of anomalies in independent areas, which all point in the direction of the primacy of consciousness. So that it's not that one thing on its own convinces me for sure. And I'm not sure this is something that can ever be proven beyond subjectivity, beyond having a personal experience with consciousness, because all that we actually know is subjectivity anyway. But that's a separate topic. Um, so. That's, I would say, the first answer is that it's not just an individual telepathy study here and there. It's the convergence of all the different things. But with regard to telepathy and other psychic phenomena, there have been attempts to isolate those sorts of issues. And an example I'm thinking of off the top of my head, studies that were done at the U.S. government. So the U.S. government ran a program using psychic spies for over 20 years during the Cold War which I was shocked to learn in my research. And I was even more shocked that the CIA uh, declassified certain documents which explicitly say that certain things are real in this, in this realm. But there were studies done with Uri Geller, who is a famous Israeli psychic who was tested at the US government. And there are documents from 1973 that I was able to include in my book. They've been declassified where they put Uri in a, an electrically shielded room and asked him to perform these psychic tasks. And he was still able to do it which is suggesting that something beyond the traditional forces that we're aware of is at play. Mm -hmm. So Yuri's in that room. And, oh, electrically shielded. So that means a radio wouldn't have worked in there. I believe so. Yes. So that, yes, you wouldn't be able to get information using waves in or out. So that would rule out the electromagnetic field. Okay, good. Um, but obviously, if everything is ultimately consciousness, then the shielding of that room is made of consciousness. <laughs> so although it could block electromagnet electromagnetic field, it couldn't block it couldn't block itself because it, it is consciousness. Right, and that's the big question: is what if there is a psychic ability, a telepathy, remote viewing, which is perceiving something that's far away using your mind? What is is something being transmitted and received? Is is there an energy force that is beyond the forces that we know of? And if we are in this kind of sea of consciousness, then it would make sense that things would be able to flow beyond the traditional forces that we're measuring. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, all this stuff is sort of subtle. I mean, in some cases, they're, you know, random number generators being influenced by, you know, mass events like 9-11 or Princess Diana's death and things like that. You know, we're talking about really infinitesimal variations from from the average, and so most people aren't even thinking about this, and they and most people aren't in a position to do the research themselves. So it's like most scientific research; you just have to say, well, I guess these guys, you know, know what they're doing. But if if you're predisposed to disbelieve it, then you you can easily sweep it under the rug or you know ignore it. And you know, I've heard stories of. Um, just as get the, the priests, uh, the church authorities, refuse to look through Galileo's telescope, I've heard stories of people refusing to look at this kind of research because it's got to be bunk. You know, it doesn't fit my paradigm. Yeah, I've heard that as well, where certain scientists don't even want to spend time looking at it because, according to their worldview, the odds that these things are real are, are so low that it's not worth spending time and money on those things, which is ends up being a self-selecting issue where then you only end up studying things that you think are real, which is kind of anti-scientific because in my mind, scientific should be the open exploration of new topics. But what you said is, is very much true. And it's, it's something I've had to look at closely. If these things are real, why is it that I have never heard of them until I listen to alternative podcasts? How, how could it be? And how could it be that so many people that I know who are well-educated have never heard of these things before? So I had to really convince myself that there was a dynamic happening where, I don't know if suppression is the right word, but there is a sweeping under the rug that seems to be happening, where there is a resistance to the paradigm. And when we look at paradigm shifts throughout history, we see similarities, where there's a reluctance to look in the telescope, in the case of Galileo. We have something very similar right now. And it 
it applies even to the world of peer review, where it's difficult to get a journal paper put into it, a paper put into a, a mainstream journal because editors don't necessarily want to put that information in there. And I've heard uh, from scientists who say that sometimes their papers are rejected without reason because the findings are, are impossible and therefore the, the journal doesn't want to publish them. So when I hear stories like that, it kind of makes sense that we are, at least up until this point, we haven't heard about some of these ideas in the mainstream. Yeah, there's a lot of politics which re represses it. And, you know, people's reputations are on the line, their tenure may be on the line, their, their grant funding may be on the line, and so they're cowed into subservience, really. That's exactly what I hear. The scientists who I think are very brave that have decided to study these topics, many of them say that if you mention these topics at all, you can kiss tenure goodbye. And many of them have waited until they got tenure to study these things, at which point they're still not shielded from criticism. Yeah. Um, a good example of that is Brian Josephson, uh -huh. who's a Nobel Prize winner in physics. I met Nobel him Prize winner day, back in the 70s. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so a brilliant guy from Cambridge, and he has said things like that he thinks telepathy is real, and he thinks that quantum physics might help us explain how this could happen. And he has been uh, turned away from a scientific conference. There was one conference in particular that he mentioned in a paper that I cite in my book, where the, the person running the, the conference said that uh, we, we understand that you have interests in the paranormal, speaking to Josephson, and this is a scientific conference, and we don't think that those topics should be included. So he was uninvited from a scientific conference as a Nobel Prize winner in physics. Yeah, Same, similar thing happened to Rupert Sheldrake. He, he was either uninvited to a TED talk or his TED talk was taken down or some such thing because he talked about this kind of stuff. Yes, yeah, I've, I've heard about that. And it, it, it seems like the stories happen over and over again. But I, I'm becoming optimistic and maybe it's because I'm just new to the space. But at the same time, there are some developments that seem very favorable. And one is the fact that in 2018, there was an article published by American Psychologist. It's the official peer reviewed journal of the American Psychological Association. So this is mainstream psychology. They accepted a study by Dr. Etzel Cardenia at Lund University, who looked at these psychic phenomena telepathy, remote viewing, precognition, which is sensing the future before it happens, psychokinesis, which is mind affecting matter. And he showed that there are statistical effects beyond what randomness would predict, uh, that there's something going on. There's something that is an anomaly occurring. And those findings were accepted to the degree that, the, that this mainstream journal published the article. So that to me is a very positive sign. Yeah. And of course, there have been tons of published articles on the effects of meditation and all, usually in terms of their physiological effects, which are, you know, which don't necessarily shatter any paradigms. You're sitting quietly and your, your, your heart rate goes down or whatever, your skin resistance changes. Um, but there was one published in the uh, Journal of Conflict Resolution some years ago um, on studies that the TM group conducted where they amassed large groups of people in trouble spots. Um, I, I myself spent three months in Iran and there were groups in Israel and you know South Southern Africa where there was a lot of trouble at that point, Central America, and there was a, a measurable and statistically significant change in war deaths and other conflict measures. Um, and it took them about two years to work up the nerve to publish that study, and they got a lot of flack after they had published it, but it was published. Yeah, there are studies here and there that are published in, in various outlets, and they're just not talked about often. I mean, to me, the fact that this uh, Etzel Cardenia study has not been, it's not front page of, of newspapers. I mean, that's a major finding that the American Psychological Association publishes a, an article like this that's validating the, the reality of psychic phenomena. So they are, these are like the little clouds that are popping up yeah. all over the place, to use Lord Kelvin's terminology. Yeah, and I think the pattern is repeating itself and will repeat itself to the conclusion that the paradigm will shift. And the pattern being that these anomalies get more and more pesky, you know, more and more insistent as they continue to accumulate and they, they kind of peck away at, at the, 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 the foundation of the, of the existing paradigm until eventually it topples and gives way to the, a shift to the new one. Yeah, I hope we see it soon. <laughs> um, but I, I, I mean, I'm, well, on one hand, I'm, in, I'm encouraged by things like some of these papers being published, but I've personally experienced some things that are that make me a little less optimistic. And I'll give an example of uh, my publicist was, was sending my information out to various outlets to try to get the information out about my book to, to market it. And we reached out to a mainstream scientific journal. 
And the editor there initially just dismissed it immediately when he heard that remote viewing was involved in this topic. Mm. And then I asked my publicist to just send uh, this editor the CIA documents, which say that remote viewing is a real phenomenon. That's a direct quote from the CIA documents and other things like it, mm. including the scientific panel that examined it. And also this Etzel Cardenia study from the American psychologist. Uh, his, his response was, he just dismissed it immediately. He said that that the CIA is not a scientific body and that the American psychologist article was amusing. <laughs> and basically said something to the effect of, unless my 35 years in scientific journalism have been an exercise in delusion. Which I guess they have been, at least to a certain extent. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you've probably heard that quote that science progresses by a series of funerals. Right, right. The idea being that those who are entrenched in the paradigm, once they, they, they are off. no longer, they, they die off, <laughs> or they're no longer a vocal uh, force. Yeah. Yeah. But I think my observation is that in every way, the pace of change is accelerating. And, um, you know, we're building up to some kind of crescendo here. And, and also the, the um, dilemmas, the potential catastrophes uh, facing us are getting more and more ominous and getting closer. Um, so something's got to give. And, um, and as, as I read in that quote from your book in the beginning of the interview, um, this whole issue of consciousness being fundamental, it's not just some kind of ontological you know, entertainment or something. It's, it's really impactful and really critical to what's going on in our world. And, uh, that, and that's why we're talking about it. But yes, yeah. And it, it applies to every single person. Yes. That's, that's the important thing. It sounds kind of intellectual when you talk about consciousness and the brain and neuroscience. Yeah, like who cares? But these are fundamental <laughs> questions about who cares? But they're fundamental questions about existence and who and what we are and how we interact with one another. So when we think about many of the problems in the world, which you, you quoted from me, whether they're interpersonal, they're personal, they're uh, international, the problems to me at their core relate to assumptions about reality, and I think many of those assumptions, according to the mainstream, that those mainstream assumptions are not correct. So it affects all of us. Yeah. And like you said, with your friends, when you told them you were researching this area and you started telling them some of the stuff, they said that it shifted their perspective. I mean, if you think about it, if you think that you're basically a meat puppet and that your existence is going to completely cease when your body dies, that's one perspective. If you think that you're an immortal soul and that the body is just like a suit of clothing that you change from time to time, uh, then that's a, a radically different perspective. It seems to me it would have a major impact on your, your mentality, your psychology, your whole, your optimism, your, your happiness. Yeah, well, I can tell you from personal experience, because I was very much in the conventional way of thinking, which says matter, i.e. the material brain creates consciousness. And therefore, when the brain dies, when the body dies, then there's no consciousness. There are no memories, no feelings, no emotions. And under that paradigm, at least the way I interpreted it, which I think is a strict interpretation, you cannot find meaning in life. You can only rationalize because once you're dead, it's over and everyone's gonna be dead because we're, we have these finite bodies. And that's, <laughs> that's the reality of what we're taught. Yeah. Uh, so that's where I came from. And is that, I think that might help your listeners understand why this is such a big shift for me. I saw this cartoon recently. I should have queued it up to show it during the interview, but it was, it was called At the Dung Beetle Bar. And, and there's a dung beetle, a couple of dung beetles sitting at the bar and the bartender's a dung beetle. And so the one guy's drinking, he's drinking. He says, so is that all there is to it, Murray? Eat shit and die? And Murray says, yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's, that's kind of where I was. And yeah. I didn't I didn't want to fight that because I thought that's what science was pointing to more and more. The notion that the universe is fully random. It's egocentric of us to think that we're more than a body. And I didn't want to rationalize. So I thought life had no meaning. And I struggled with that, not necessarily outwardly, but in my day-to-day -day life, if something would happen to me that seemed ostensibly good or bad, in the back of my mind, I said, Mark, why does it matter? In the end, it doesn't matter at all. You're just making it up. And then when I learned this other information, which is what you suggested, that we are, our identity is much more than the body, that we're really a consciousness that's experiencing the physical world through a body, rather than being a body that has a consciousness. That shift rocked me and took me time to adjust to. I'm probably still adjusting. Yeah, I think we're always, always all still adjusting. But, and there's another thing, I think, that as a ripple effect of the materialistic assumption, which is that, you know, if, if, what, if what you are and what you appear to be and what you 
accumulate in your life is all there is to it, then the, you know he who dies with the most toys wins is might be your per, your predominant attitude. And we live in a very sort of materialistic society, one in which there's huge wealth inequity, uh, and which a lot of people are really not living very happy lives because they're so impoverished. Um, that there might be one example of the, of the upside down thinking that you know it, it's a, just a material world and that we, when we when you die you're gone. Yeah, I mean, if, if it were true that, that material goods would make us happy, then we should see that every billionaire or superstar should be ex in ecstasy all the time. And we certainly don't see that. So there seems to be something happening beyond this, this notion that materialism is everything that there is. Yeah. And um, that reminds me of, of one of the phenomena that I think has had one of the, probably the biggest impact on me. It's, it's in the near-death experience which is an instance where a person has little or no brain functioning, and yet their consciousness is totally lucid and rational and logical. Sometimes the things that they see from out of their body is actually, those things are reported as being accurate when they come back in their body and are resuscitated. Yeah. But on this topic, the life review is something that occurs during this period where a person experiences their whole life in a flash and they're judging and observing themselves and they're seeing how they acted towards people. They're not judging how big their house was or what kind of car they're driving. They're judging how they treated the other person. And if they were inflicting pain upon that person, they feel that person's pain through that person's eyes. Mm. And it's a very powerful thing to think about that all of our actions, if that is something that we all encounter, a life review, that how we treat other people is, is what actually matters. Um, there's, there's a great example of, from Daniel Brinkley, who I also interviewed for my podcast. He recently had his fourth near-death experience. Wow. Once he was electrocuted, twice during open heart surgery, one during brain surgery. Well, and he got, but he's had he, a, he got struck by lightning a couple times. At least struck once. by lightning, yeah. and he picked up a phone, and yeah, that was his yeah. first one. But in his case, he had a life review every single time, uh -huh. in addition to going to other realms. Uh -huh. And he was a Marine and killed many people yeah, in he Vietnam. Was a sharpshooter in Vietnam. Sharpshooter. So he had to go back and during his life review and experience the deaths of the people that he killed mm. and experience the pain that he inflicted upon them. Not only that, but he experienced the pain of the people that were affected by the person that were killed. Mm -hmm. So the child that lost a parent, he felt that pain. So when we think about the life review and you talk to people that have had a near-death experience, they come back into their body and they are often much less materialistic because they see this broader reality. And to them, all that seems to matter is how they treat people. So Daniel Brinkley, he's now a hospice volunteer. Yeah, yeah I should interview him one of these days. I, I enjoyed his books. Um, they also, uh, you know, not only do they tend to change how they live their life, but it also radically changes their attitude toward death. They no longer fear it. They're, they're not suicidal, but they're no longer, they're kind of looking forward to death because they've seen a glimpse of how beautiful it, it is on the other side. Yes, I hear that very often. It's the, and I've actually heard someone say to me, I, I'm not suicidal, Mark, but I really want to go back there because it's such a pleasurable place to be in this, these other realms being freed of the body, so to speak. But when we talk about these ideas in the context of the world that we live in and the traditional education system, these are not the things that we are always learning. It is about achievement and the attainment of material goods in the hopes, I think perhaps falsely, that we will then become happy and satisfied once we achieve all of those material things. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with having a you know, certain amount of them. You need that to be comfortable and even to engage in spiritual practice. It's hard to do that if you're living under a bridge, but it's not sort of the be all and end all. That's a great point. In the same way that the world is not actually physical, but we perceive it to be physical, we are in this realm where we need physical things to survive. So there is nothing wrong with the material world, so to speak. But I think it's maybe the emphasis that's placed on it can be recontextualized if we think about the fact that maybe we're all going to have a life review, as for example. And in that life review, what we are judging our life on is not based on the material goods. It's about the treatment of others because we are interconnected. Yeah, well, it worked for Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> um, here's a question that came in from Mark in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, Mark asks, do you find a relationship between electromagnetic fields and collective consciousness and what the accelerating shift of the north magnetic pole towards the eastern hemisphere means? That's an interesting thing that's been going on, actually. With the it's pole. a good question. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard of that. I, I, the answer is I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that needs to be explored more fully. And part of the reason I think we're not exploring it fully is that these ideas are not, they're not mainstream. So many scientists 
who are studying electromagnetic fields aren't able to look at them. So if we start to integrate the topic of consciousness with these global shifts, what could we find? It's a great question and I think it needs to be explored. Yeah. Let's, let's bring up a point from your book, and, um, and which many others have discussed, which indicates that uh, there is something more fundamental than electro, the electromagnetic field or any field taking place here. And that is, uh, I believe it's called complementarity, where uh, you can have particles that are separated by light years. And um, I don't know exactly how they test this, but it's, it's established science. And that um, a change in one produces instantly uh, a change in the other and there's no way that the speed of light or anything could get from one to the other um, yeah so that sort of presupposes some kind of omnipresent field that is infinitely correlated uh, and through which information if we call it information can travel instantly and it's, it's, known what, it's what Einstein called spooky action at a distance Yes, spooky action at a distance, non-local connections. Mm -hmm. uh, in in physics, many physicists call it entanglement or quantum entanglement. The notion that two particles well, that maybe are it's physically entanglement, not complementarity. I might have had the wrong term there. Go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, entanglement, which is the notion that two particles physically distant from one another, mm -hmm. no matter how far apart they are, when you affect one, the other one has an instantaneous correlated effect, where they're basically mirroring each other, even though they are far apart. And Einstein called it spooky because he thought that the, the fastest that anything could travel is the speed of light. And here we have an instantaneous connection. Einstein tried to disprove this. And he, in, in disproving it, he actually further proved that it is, is a real thing. And now it is accepted science that there are non-local connections at the core of reality. Yeah. Uh, you have, are you aware of how these are explained? Any, anybody have I, I, an idea for this, or is it just like one of those head scratchers? That... My understanding is that it's, it's something that is trying to be understood because it's, to me, if we incorporate consciousness and the idea that consciousness is fundamental or primary, or as Erwin Schrodinger said, in truth, there is only one mind that we're part of the same mind, mm -hmm. that might help us start to explain these things. I think most of the people watching this are pretty much on board with us, the stuff we're saying, but. A simple analogy that we could use and that they might want to use if they're talking to friends about it is that of a radio, you know, I mean, or a radio, obviously, that's a good one, or a cell phone. But, you know, there's a radio transmitter maybe 60 miles away and your little radio picks it up. Um, and so like that, the human nervous system could be thought of not as a generator of consciousness, but rather as a receiver of consciousness. Um, you want to riff on that a little bit? That's an important topic. And I think when there's a paradigm shift, the history books are going to write a lot of papers on this topic of how, why is it that we thought that the brain produced consciousness, given all this evidence that we have. And there are a few reasons to think that the brain produces consciousness. One is that our sensory organs are located near our brain, so it feels like our consciousness is up here. But if we put our eyes at our shins or our toes or something, it might feel, it might feel differently. So we should just think about that we are biased by where our eyes are. But even more than that, more scientifically, the fact that there are strong correlations between what happens in the brain and what happens to your consciousness, that is biasing us. So what do I mean by that? Let's say someone gets in a car accident and they have brain damage. They might have corresponding memory loss. So we change the brain, we change the consciousness. Another example is if you stimulate a part of the brain, let's say you take it a little electrode, you stimulate the part of the brain responsible for vision, and then you start to have different vision. So look, we change the brain, now we change the conscious experience. Super tight correlation. Now, why can't we conclude that the brain must be producing consciousness based on that tight correlation? And I'll use an analogy from Dr. Bernardo Kastrup in his book. It's called Why Materialism is Baloney. He's been on so that gap twice, but continue. Okay, so he, he says we should imagine that there's a fire and you have firefighters that show up. Uh, you have a larger fire, many firefighters show up. So you have a strong correlation between how large the fire is and how many firefighters are appearing. But the firefighters aren't causing the fire. And that just illustrates that just because two things are related, we can't always say that one is causing the other. And this gets to your point. Well, how else could we explain the fact that our brain is definitely related to our consciousness? It's somehow related to it, but if it's not producing it necessarily, what could, it, what could be the relationship? The, the an analogy of an antenna, I think, is a, is a helpful one because it places the brain in a processing role, so to speak, that the brain is taking in consciousness and almost spitting it out in a new form. Uh, there's an analogy that I, I think is maybe the most precise, uh, 
which is to say that the brain is almost a filtering mechanism mm -hmm. of consciousness. So it's like consciousness is the sun shining all the time, and we have clouds, whether it's our, our brain, our thoughts, our mind, our perceptions, and they're actually blocking rays of the sun. So the brain is a limiter. And when we have experiences like a near-death experience where the person's brain is shut off, or meditation, which is a bit more subtle, where there's a calming of the mind, it's like a removal of clouds and more pure consciousness is able to come in. Yeah. The second verse of the Yoga Sutras is yoga, or meditation, we could say, is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. So there's a calming of the mind. And then the, the next verse is, then the seer is established in the self. So it's like, you know, if the mind is agitated, then like water trying to reflect sunlight, the, the reflection isn't very clear, it's all broken up. But if the mind is settled, like settled water, then the, the, the reflection can be very brilliant. And that's what the whole spiritual practice thing is all about, basically. Yeah, it's, it's been so fascinating for me to, to learn that the ancient traditions have been saying this for a long time. And now science is really pointing to these, these same concepts that we can find from ancient scriptures. So these, the topics we're talking about are not new in any way. And maybe for, for your audience, that is an obvious thing. But I, I will say to, to many people that I've spoken to, they're just so shocked that people have been saying this for a long time, that cultures have known about how we think about consciousness uh, as being potentially a fundamental aspect of reality. And now science is finally catching up to it. Yeah. You know, one thing that would really shock the culture and change the paradigm pronto um, Throughout history, there have been numerous accounts of people levitating. Uh, a friend of mine wrote a book, uh, kind of a accumulating or you know, amassing all these different accounts. It comes from cultures all over the world. And it's easy to sort of brush that one away as sort of, um, you know, some kind of imaginative thing. That, uh, but, but there have been so many accounts, and even some fairly recently. Um, if someone were to do that, it would, I mean, and, and it were proven that they weren't just a good magician or something. It would really blow some minds. And we'd have to ask ourselves, how can they do that? You know, I mean, what are the mechanics through which physical laws are apparently being violated or, or counteracted? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? You know, many of the studies that I reference in the book, including the one from the American psychologist, they're talking about small statistical effects. Yeah. In other words, if you weren't looking at the math, you wouldn't know that something's happening. You have to look at the math to see that it's a deviation beyond what just chance would predict. These more extreme cases where it's actually visible, they're much more anomalous. They're much rarer, it seems, in my research. And looking at the U.S. government program, that's a good example, where there were a number of people that are really, really good at remote viewing. And there's an example that a former U.S. president, Jimmy Carter, confirmed that a downed Russian bomber was found in an African jungle. It was lost. The radar systems couldn't find it. And they used remote viewers to be able to locate this bomber using their minds. But though the number of people that can do that, it seems to be a smaller group. So it's like there's a distribution of abilities in the same way that for sports, like basketball, you have Michael Jordan on one end who's a superstar, and then you have an average person who can dribble a basketball. Yeah. The number of, number of Michael Jordans in the world, they, it seems to be a smaller number. So I think that is one issue, is that we can't always find the Michael Jordans. And then another issue is that, I think especially with uh, people who have, have developed spiritual practices, it tends to be a spontaneous occurrence where it's not always planned. Yes and no. I mean, well, firstly, I think LeBron James should get some credit. I mean, we've, been, we've been quoting more Michael Jordan for a long time now. <laughs> These days, LeBron is king. Um, <laughs> yeah, LeBron. We'll go with LeBron. <laughs> right. Or Serena Williams, if you want to switch to tennis. Um, yeah. But um, this thing about it not, not being planned, not being a spontaneous event, or ha having to be a spontaneous event, maybe certain things are, but spiritual practices can be systematic. I mean, there are people throughout history who have practiced things in a very systematic, regular, repetitive way, and it ultimately has yielded some fruit, huh? No, absolutely. Yeah. But the, the, sometimes the anomalous occurrence, as far as I've understood it, sometimes it is spontaneous, where the practice can be done, but not the, the uh, anomalous event doesn't always occur with it. And so it seems to be that these things can be difficult to pin down, and even those that are really talented at it, like the LeBron Jameses of remote viewing, it's not always 100%. Right. 
maybe the same with the, with the, the person who does spiritual practices. Maybe it's not 100%. And the skeptic will want to latch on to the few instances where it's not perfect. Yeah. And of course, spiritual practices are not primarily about having particular flashy experiences or demonstrating some kind of supernatural ability. But, but those things have been associated with spiritual practice. I mean, Patanjali, the third chapter of, of the Yoga Sutras, which is four chapters, is all about cities being able to do these things actually intentionally on demand, more or less. Um, and he lists a whole bunch of different things you can do if you're able to do, to do them, and he prescribes actually a formula for doing them. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, that's interesting, but it's hard to find contemporary examples. It's hard to find contemporary examples and to find uh, people to do it in, in a rigorous enough way that the mainstream will accept it or even look at it. Um, but it, it, it is kind of mind-blowing to know that, that these practices have been around for a long time. People have reported and have had experienced um, psychic phenomena, paranormal or anomalous phenomena, and yet we haven't been able to document them in a way that is at least satisfactory to the mainstream. Although I would say that there's been a significant documentation of a lot of this stuff. It's just not being looked at. Yeah. Some would say that the suppression of these kinds of things is not just uh, cultural or intellectual uh, kind of thing, but it actually has to do with the quality of collective consciousness. That there's a sort of a density to it that keeps these things tamped down. And that as that density clears, like the dispelling of clouds, um, spontaneously a lot of uh, things that we now consider rarities and anomalies will become more and more commonplace. I've heard that idea, sort of like as consciousness evolves, so to speak, if the collective evolves to a new state, then certain things will become yeah, more commonplace. Yeah. And I hope that's the case, because if that were true, then I think many of the world's problems might start to shift. I think I'm seeing it in terms of um, all the people I talk to and, and who communicate with me. There, there just seems to be some kind of epidemic of awakening consciousness around the world. People start having kundalini experiences and all who didn't know anything about kundalini or you know these spontaneous awakenings who weren't even looking for them and all. So it it's definitely seems to be something getting enlivened, I think. I, I'm noticing that as well. And I've been surprised to know how many people have known about these topics and are experiencing them on a regular basis. And as I've kind of gotten into that world more, I'm seeing exactly what you're seeing, where there are more awakenings, sometimes spontaneous ones. The sand community, science and non-duality, lots of people talk about their experiences there. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a growing, it's a growing community globally. Yeah, it's exciting. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of things in your book that we could get into, a lot of different topics we can discuss. Um, but one that comes to mind at the moment is, I think I'll preface it with a quote from Einstein, which I'll put up on the screen here. He said, contemplate the mystery of conscious life perpetuating itself through all eternity to reflect upon the marvelous structure of the universe, which we can dimly perceive and try humbly to comprehend even an infinitesimal part of the intelligence manifested in nature. So mm -hmm. I like that quote. Um, you want to comment on that before? The, fir anything? the first thing that came to mind is the notion of humility, uh -huh. which has been an important one on my journey, which is to continue to acknowledge how little I know or could ever know using my intellectual, rational mind. That the linear brain, the way we think about things in a linear fashion, is a, a sliver of reality. And things are happening beyond what our intellect can sometimes comprehend, or even if they are things that our intellect can comprehend, maybe we don't know them yet. And keeping that open mind, I think, is really critical. And it might be one of the things that is holding us back in other areas, the tendency to think that we know much more than we actually do. Yeah. I think that there's a, there's a value to uh, the sort of like adherence to certain established knowledge. I mean, if we were willing to just sort of brush it aside with any little contradictory notion that came along, there'd be no sort of stability or consistency. So there's a value to that. But... But generally, it, it becomes too um, calcified, too, rig too rigid. And um, as we discussed earlier, there's a, a value of counterbalancing that with open-mindedness. And I think you can do that. You don't have to either be, you know, anything goes and I'll accept any wacky idea that comes along, or, you know, I know it all and, and I'm not going to change my mind. You can somehow 
broaden your awareness to incorporate both the stability of, of what is known with the open-mindedness to accept new knowledge. It's a really important point you make. So th this materialist paradigm, which says matter creates consciousness, we, get, we start with matter, we end up with chemistry, biology, brains, neuroscience, then consciousness. And what we're talking about today is, is, is saying consciousness comes first. But still, we have physics and chemistry and biology and neuroscience. We're not saying that those things should be thrown out. Yeah, it's just work. a recontextualization. They yeah, work. Yeah. yeah. So that's important. It, we, it's, it's kind of finding a middle ground in all of this um, and not, not taking too extreme a position. Yeah. And if, science, if scientists in, at large were really scientific in general, they would do that. You know, because it, it is definitely unscientific to let personal bias or fear or worry about tenure or any, any of those other things, you know, to keep to close your mind. Um, you're not. I mean, science is open to anything. Every, anything could be a, a hypothesis worthy of testing, if you're really it, being it, scientific about it. That's the scientific approach. It should technically be non-dogmatic. It should be. If there is a finding, we should explore it and see if it's real, then how we might be able to incorporate it rather than saying everything should fit into this box. And if it doesn't, then it's it's not accepted. That is almost an unscientific approach. So it's it's taking that approach. And, it, and again, it kind of goes against some of our instincts to want to cling, cling on to security of what we know or what our sensory organs are showing us. We have to counteract some of those instincts to just be open and willing to accept things that might challenge us. Yeah. Well put. Um, so back to that Einstein quote, I won't read it again, but um, one of the things that, you know, he uses the word intelligence there. And when we talk about what consciousness is, we can, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, and it being the basis of the universe, perhaps the ultimate foundation of the universe, perhaps the essential constituent of the universe, perhaps the entirety of the universe, maybe there's nothing other than consciousness appearing as a universe, then what does that tell us about the qualities of consciousness? Mm. When I think about consciousness, the way I define it in the book is it's that it's our subjective inner experience. And when I say that I am speaking to you, Rick, that I, that's what I mean by consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's not a tangible thing, but it has a sentience to it, an awareness to it as a property. And what I argue in the book is that that awareness that I am experiencing is part, is part of the same uh, stream of consciousness that we're all connected to, which is the basis of all reality, essentially. So what is consciousness? In the book, I, I include a footnote when I define consciousness. And I say that even though I try to define it using language, that is perhaps, um, it, it's perhaps limiting. Because if consciousness is the fundamental aspect of reality, existing beyond all space and time, and is actually infinite, then to put language around it is creating a limitation that shouldn't exist. So by talking about consciousness, we are constricting it and actually not purely being it. I think that we could do our best to talk about it as long as we acknowledge that words will never do, never do justice to it. <clears throat> you know, we can use words like unbounded or universal or blissful or, or whatever, but they're just words. Uh, and they all, they all, they point to something that potentially could be experienced, but we shouldn't get too hung up on the words. Yeah, that's how I feel about it too. We, we need language in today's day and age to communicate, and so we do our best. But keeping in mind that something that might be infinite, to, to put language on it would put an artificial boundary on it. Yeah. But that's true of almost everything, not just consciousness. I mean, um, try to describe the taste of an orange, or try to describe what being in love is like, or any of those things. They're, ju they're just words, they're concepts, and if the other person has tasted the orange, or been in love or something, then, then there could be some communication that's you know, they really understand what you're talking about, but if they haven't, you could talk to your blue in the face and, and they're really not going to get anything like what the actual experience will be. Right. It's a proxy. And what, what you're <coughs> reminding me of the near-death experience where people come back and say, look, I can't really use words to explain this, known as ineffability. And that's part of the disconnect is that people who have had these mystical experiences, it's hard sometimes to explain it using human language to others who haven't had the experience mm -hmm. because the language is a proxy and it's not the actual thing. Yeah. So a minute ago you said consciousness is, you, you define consciousness as subjective experience. Is that what you said? Yeah, our subjective inner experience. Inner experience. So let's say for the sake of metaphor that a radio is conscious of what it's playing. Um, so a radio is playing the Beatles. And, you know, the radio might say, well, you know, my, my subjective inner experience is the Beatles. But that doesn't define the electromagnetic field. 
you know. I mean, the electromagnetic field is a much vaster, more significant thing than any particular um, vibration of it, which could give rise to a particular song through a radio. Yeah, to use a term from Rupert Spira, he talks about modulations of consciousness. Yes. That it's sort of like if we're in a, a still body of water, we get little waves that pop up and those modulations create diversity. Mm -hmm. So consciousness is the, the basic underpinning of reality and all of the things that we experience, whether they're electromagnetic fields or uh, just a tree that we see. Those are all just different modulations of the same consciousness. Right. And in that video we, I alluded to earlier about whether consciousness is the unified field, um, it was presented that both consciousness and the unified field, which you know Hagelin was claiming are one and the same, um, arise and give or appear to give rise to the manifest universe by these modulations or, or vibrations um, at a very, very fundamental level, and that they in turn become more and more sort of complex through something called sequential spontaneous symmetry breaking until you have um, you know a manifest universe but the whole thing arises from that foundation that's how I see it and the mechanics of how that all happens that is still an open scientific question but um, I don't think we'll get there unless we acknowledge the primacy of consciousness or at least entertain it and to me one of the, the strongest arguments for this is something that Bernardo Castro has made and a number of other people, which is to, to say we should look at our own experience and our own experience is always subjective. I can't prove anything outside of my own experience, n nor can anyone. We can infer it. Um, so if we take that steps further and we say, imagine that there's a material universe with no conscious beings, no awareness, no sentience at all, just a material universe. Could that universe be there in the first place? And when we think about it, it, yeah, it's possible, but we could never verify that it was there because it would take a conscious awareness There'd be to no have some to verify it. There'd be no we to verify it in any way, whether it's seeing or hearing, there's no way to verify it. So if we want to be truly skeptical, the skeptic would say, all we know is consciousness. So to say consciousness is fundamental is ironically the most skeptical position metaphysically. Hmm. But if the universe arose from consciousness, if consciousness is fundamental um, to creation, then if modern cosmology is correct, presumably there was a period of billions of years in which there couldn't have been any sentient beings around to perceive the universe, and yet the universe was able to evolve on its own to the point where such beings began to exist. So that, that line of reasoning would presume that sentience and consciousness needs a biological body to exist. And if consciousness is independent of the brain, then we don't need a brain or a, a biological organism. No, not for consciousness to exist, but for per perhaps for perception to take place. You need perceptual, you need senses. In, in apparatus? Yeah. Well, what, what, I, what I mean by consciousness being able to experience or verify the universe is any kind of awareness, even if it's not in the body. So if we look at someone with a near-death experience, their organs are totally turned off. Uh, so I'll give examples of blind individuals, people who have been blind since birth. And there's a great book called Mind Sight. Who looks at, they look at 31 cases of this where the person's been blind since birth, they have a near-death experience, and they experience all the same things that a sighted person has reported throughout the ages, including being able to see. And then they come back into their body and they are unable to see again or have the same impairment. So it suggests that the way we perceive is not tied to biology. That there is this, as, the, as Kenneth Ring and his colleague referred to, they call it the transcendental awareness that exists independently of a functioning body. So if that sort of awareness can exist without biological organisms in the universe, then presumably there could have been a, an awareness at that period. Yeah. What, um, one explanation for the, what those blind people experience is that we not only have a gross body, but we have a subtle body. And the subtle body actually has senses um, through which things can be experienced. Um, and that would account for you know, disembodied beings, spirits, astral beings, angels, ghosts, all that kind of stuff, being able to experience without having any kind of actual biological material. It's just an astral or, or subtler level. Right, right, but still non-physical. Still non-physical, yes. Non-physical. Yes, less physical, yes. beyond the physicality that we are 
assuming to be the only reality of, of materialism. Yeah. So even an etheric body or however it's done, that is, that's still a major departure from the conventional wisdom. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> although conventionally we deal with all kinds of things that are non-physical. That's the irony of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you spoke about randomness earlier on. And I read that Fred Hoyle quote about a 747 being assembled from a junk pile by a tornado. Um, I wonder how conventional science understands how all of this beauty and complexity and detail arose through some process of randomness from, you know, basically hydrogen. Um, how do they explain that? Mm -hmm. Well, I can give you the answer I would have given you mm -hmm. a few years ago, and maybe this is aligned with scientists or not. I, I probably got it from scientists that I was reading, which is that in a huge universe, we, we know with the law of large numbers that certain things will happen based on chance. When you have enough trials of something, you're, you're bound to end up with diversity. And one part of that diversity could be the complexity of life. It's just a chance emergence out of Law, many, many things happening, and we're seeing a speck where uh, diversity in life evolved. So a speck on our planet or a speck in this whole universe being such a speck because it's, it's obviously full of diversity? I think it would depend on who you talk to. But I, I've sensed that, that more and more scientists are open to the notion that there is some form of life, even if it's not as advanced as human beings, elsewhere in the universe just based on chance alone. Sure. And even on our planet, I mean, when a daffodil grows or something, it's not just doing that by chance. It's doing that in a very orderly way, you know, um, extracting nutrients from the ground and the sunlight and, and so on and so forth and coming, coming out with this beautiful thing. It's, it's, a, it's sort of the, the second law of thermodynamics doesn't dominate in, in our world. It, 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 there are so many things that counteract it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, now, yeah, with my perspective, looking at consciousness as being the fundamental aspect, which is kind of a, instead of a, a bottom-up approach that we emerge from matter and consciousness comes out, it's more of like a top-down. Consciousness is fundamental and everything is emerging within it. It's just, it's much easier to explain this kind of diversity with, with an underlying awareness or sentience than it is using randomness. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Muktananda wrote a book called Play of Consciousness, and in the, in the Vedic tradition, they use the word lila, and they say the whole creation is a play of consciousness. That, but, but the implication is that it's pure intelligence, pure unbounded intelligence. It's not just consciousness, but it, it has this sort of creative potency uh, that wants to give rise to more and more sophisticated forms through which it can experience itself as a, as a living reality. Mm -hmm. That makes much more sense to me. Than it used to, I'll say, and it, and it could explain the diversity that we see all over the planet and all over the universe. Yeah. Huh. So um, let's go through some of the things in your book, that you, some of the chapters. I mean, obviously not in tremendous detail, but um, you, you outline a number of different areas that you feel um, buttress the argument for consciousness being fundamental. And uh, I've got the table of contents in front of me here, but... I, I'm sure you have them in mind. So let's go through a few of them. And people who are listening or watching live, if you want to send in a question, there's a form at the bottom of the upcoming interviews page on batgap.com. So it's to preface this discussion, my approach when I started my research was I was exposed to anomalies, things that didn't make sense. So I didn't start with looking at the brain versus consciousness. I didn't start by saying, I think consciousness is fundamental. It started with a number of independent phenomena that I couldn't make sense of. And as I did more and more research and saw more of these phenomena studied by people independently in independent areas, it all converged on this idea that consciousness is primary and that consciousness doesn't come from the brain. And that's the way the book was ultimately structured after that large body of research. It comes back to the idea of we all have a consciousness. Anyone listening to this right now or watching it has a consciousness. It is there. How is it there? Is it from the brain or is it not from the brain? And the book explores a number of independent phenomena, which if real, could be explained much more easily by saying consciousness is not from the brain. Whereas we'd have a really hard time by saying consciousness is just stuck in our skull. 
So that's the that's the preface for for these various phenomena. And I divide it into two major categories, and each has its own chapter. So the first category is psychic phenomena, and e the chapters within that are the evidence for remote viewing, perceiving something at a distance, telepathy, which is mind-to-mind -mind communication, precognition, which is knowing or sensing the future before it happens, uh, animals that exhibit these abilities as well, psychic, uh, excuse me, psychokinesis, which is the ability for the mind to affect matter without any physical contact. So that's the kind of wizard-like psychic abilities category. The other category is evidence that consciousness survives after bodily death. And the three chapters there are near-death experiences, communications with the deceased, including uh, planned accounts like mediumship and also spontaneous ones. And the third is children who have memories of a previous life. And that's from uh, research coming out of the University of Virginia in particular for over 50 years. Yeah. Um, well, all, I, these things are all kind of like matter of fact assumptions for me. Um, <laughs> I'd be interested in, in if anybody listening is skeptical about any of these things, if they would like to voice their skepticism, I'm sure you could address it. Um, but one thing that I, I often thought of while reading your book or, you know, listening to various other interviews you did is, you know, it might be interesting to, uh, for you to present some of the most um, intelligent skepticism you've encountered you know has anyone rather than just brushing you off has anyone actually sat you down and given you a, a really good argument as to why this that or the other thing might be seen a different way mm. i haven't heard any arguments that have swayed me but i've heard uh, arguments that look at specific cases mm -hmm. so uh, for, for the for the sake of your audience the reason that i i, I position the book the way I did, where I have each of these independent phenomena, is that I reason that if any one of these things is real, we have to rethink the paradigm. So it's not necessarily the case that every single anomaly ever reported is real, and that the statistics were properly done every time. I cannot personally verify that. But when I look at the large body of evidence, I have a hard time as a rational human being saying that every single one's wrong. So that's the, the, the overarching premise here, and I haven't heard of anyone who's been able to shoot down every single one. But within individual cases, I have heard things like, well, the statistics were manipulated here. And they, using complex math, that I, the statistics is beyond me, they say, well, they, this was not done properly, and therefore the study is not valid. Uh, I've heard things like, well, these are anecdotal cases, and we need controlled scientific studies to be able to verify that something exists. And to me, that, uh, that doesn't really work for me, because everything is experienced subjectively, and we can't just throw that out. Um, so to the short answer to your question, Rick, is that I haven't heard anything that has compelled me to, to throw all of it out. No, not all of it. And it's fair enough to say that, you know, some studies are shoddy and some are well done and some people are phonies and some are genuine and all that stuff, you know. So, I mean, it, Houdini spent a lot of his life trying to um, verify psychic phenomena and life after death stuff, and he debunked a lot of, of psychics and so on. Um, but, you know, one anomaly doesn't, I mean, one, one sort of phony or, or, or weak study doesn't, doesn't trash the whole bunch. I mean, there are people who you know, take the sort of email scandal of some British climatologists and say, that, well, clim climate change is bunk because, these, the, because they cherry picked some guy's emails and, you know, uh, they appear to be monkeying with, with data. But anyway, like, like you're saying, I mean, that, that's going to happen with pretty much any field of scientific endeavor. There's going to be a broad range of studies and a broad range of quality of those studies. Uh, but the, you have to sort of take the entirety of it and look at how solid it is. And I think in the area we're talking about, there's a lot of information out there now that's really hard to ignore unless you yeah. put your head in the sand. <laughs> but you make an important point that the, the bad apples in the barrel, those are the ones that seem to get the most attention. And if you don't have a lot of time to research these things and you see a headline or you see a Wikipedia article that says all this has been debunked, and maybe some of it has, rightly so, where there have been studies that have been done improperly or there are frauds, just like in any other area, those get all the attention and then it causes people to put this whole domain in another area, which is, oh, that's all fraudulent. And it's that maybe uh, inability or, or lack of adjustment to say maybe those are just a few cases and it's not the reflective of the whole. Yeah. It's kind of like the whole 
extraterrestrial thing where, yeah, maybe there were some weather balloons, but boy, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that's really hard to explain. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, a question came in from, let's see if I can pronounce this, from Guilherme Coelho from Sao Paulo, Brazil. South America is on today. Um, he said, I would like to know more about your opinion of free will and choice. More and more neuroscientists, including Sam Harris, he didn't say that, but I'm adding it, have come to the conclusion that choice and free will are an illusion or unrealistic construction of the brain. Uh, Michael Gazaniga is one of them. What are your thoughts? Mm. Well, if we think about what is reality, reality under this idea is, is all consciousness. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is the basis of existence. And therefore, at the level of pure consciousness, there would be infinite free will. That's how I would see it, because if consciousness is all there is, then that, if we're talk, thinking about the sea of consciousness, then that sea has free will. Mm -hmm. Now, each of us were a part of that stream, but it starts to get abstract. Does the individual actually exist as we perceive the individual? And so is there, a, is there a, an individual if we're all part of the sea? Is it just really the sea that has the free will? And we are, we are, we are free will instruments within that sea. So I guess the way I would, I would summarize it is, I think there is free will in the universe at the basic level of reality. And I, secondly, I think the concept of free will is, is a human construct. It's something that we have created with the limited mind and we have a particular perspective on what free will is and we're kind of like answering our own limited question. So it might be something that is also just beyond the, the, the comprehension of the limited human mind. Hmm. I think one way of looking at it is like it, kind of like what you just said. I mean, the, this consciousness in its ground state, in its fundamental nature, is a field of all possibilities. Um, and as it begins to manifest, then it has to do so in particular streams. Um, and so the possibilities become you know, more and more limited as it, as it manifests, um, you know, and, you know, birds can't swim underwater. Humans can't fly like birds. I mean, once you get into a particular form or, or, or structure, then that structure has its limitations, but it's still permeated by and essentially is that which is a field of all possibilities. So if you could, as a human being, if you could culture the ability to maintain that unboundedness of awareness while functioning within boundaries, then you kind of have the best of both worlds. I totally agree with you. That's how I see it as well. And it's, it's in line with what many mystics have said for a long time, which is aligning with that awareness when we are just being in the world. That's kind of the optimal state. Yeah, good. I suppose another analogy we could use is water, you know, which is it doesn't have a form or a shape, but if, if you put it in molds and then freeze it, like popsicles or something like that, then it has a particular shape. And it, it, it doesn't have the sort of the fluidity uh, of, of that water originally had, but it's still water. Right. It has a limitation or a restriction, but within the same context. Yeah. Huh. One implication of what I just said, I think, <clears throat> is that if you get focused into boundaries, without having access to unboundedness, then you're inevitably frustrated because you are that unboundedness. There's beautiful quotes from Rumi and all about how you are this, you know, field of all possibilities. Um, and so, you know, that, that might be why, as Thoreau said, most men live lives of quiet desperation because you're stuck and you know that you're more than that. Um, mm -hmm. But if you could somehow access that, that something more and live that while yet enjoying life as a human being, then there's a sort of a tremendous um, freedom and fulfillment and, um, you know, lack of, of such frustration. Yeah, it's a liberating transition. And I can say it because it's so fresh for me <laughs> that it, it's, you ha it's, a, it's a, a, the materialist perspective is one of limitation inherently. And that applies to one's own identity as well. But maybe there is that knowing in the background, that, that awareness that's always been there, that's kind of been overlooked throughout one's life like it was for me. But once one taps into that, it is a, just an incredibly liberating experience. Yeah. And again, concrete practical applications of this. I mean, I often mention the opioid epidemic because I think it's such a shame. All these people are trying to, you know, blot out their consciousness because they're so un unhappy or whatever it is that motivates them. 
uh, and all, all these people are dying. But golly, I mean, if they could contrast what they're experiencing, uh, either on opioids or before taking them, with what it's possible to experience, you know, with what, say, Ramana experienced or Jesus Christ or you know, one of these great sages, uh, they would be so inspired by that vision of possibilities, they, they'd never be able to forget it. So, so the, the birthright of man, of human beings, is tremendous, and we're just not really realizing it as a, as a society. With instances like opioids and other drugs or anything that's external to bring us happiness, it's almost like a mis misattribution of pleasure. Mm. We attribute, let's let's call it a drug. Um, we'll say an addictive drug. We we someone takes it and then they become happy, and we say it was because of the drug. And it's really a maybe a, a, a misinterpretation. If we use the analogy of the sun and clouds, maybe what the drug is doing is just removing some of the clouds. So you, that you're experiencing more of those rays of consciousness. So all of the the drug is doing is kind of redu is unlocking the filter that was already there. And we're saying it's because of the drug that that happened. But we have that innate capability uh, within us. Yeah, they say that of psychedelics. That psychedelics thin the filter or remove the filter or some of the filters, so that we're experiencing a lot of stuff that's ordinarily outside the realm of our experience. <clears throat> With downers, you know, with opioids, it seems like it's the opposite is the case. We're sort of just trying to make the filter even darker so that we can just kind of become unconscious and, uh, you know, not have to feel anything. Yeah, or it's it's dulling disturbances. If there are disturbances to the rays of consciousness, maybe they're clouds or something else. But it's it's a dulling that allows us to experience more of the pure consciousness, so to speak. And we are saying that the opioid or whatever it is we're taking, that is the cause. But it's actually just an enabler to something that's already there. Yeah. Okay, so I'm enjoying talking to you. I don't, I don't want this to end, but um, I also don't have a whole big, huge list of questions in front of me. So anytime you feel inspired to say anything that we haven't discussed, just bring it right out and we'll do it. Um, okay. Anything at the moment? Yeah, we haven't talked about the, the research at the University of Virginia. Okay. And I, I think it's important to talk about them because they're a mainstream, credible, established institution, and they've been looking at this for 50 years. And one of the areas of study, they also look at near-death experiences and altered states of consciousness, but they've spent a lot of time looking at over 2,500 cases of children who are reporting very distinct memories of a life that is not theirs. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, the children have memories or certain preferences that just don't make sense based on the life that they have. And to me, the most compelling cases are the ones where the children have physical deformities, birthmarks, birth defects, that are aligned with how the person died in the previous life mm -hmm. and where the researchers sometimes can find medical or historical records to verify that the person died in that manner. And here we have the person's new body as a child uh, sharing physical manifestations. Yeah, I had a friend who had a lump on the back of his head and he claimed to have been Abraham Lincoln in his past life, but I was skeptical of him. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, you have any idea how that would happen, uh, that um, physical deformity coming into this next life? It is, it is not well understood, but it's the, the researchers at UVA uh, tend to think that reincarnation is the best explanation. So if we use Dr. Kastrup's analogy of reality being like a stream of water, and we are all whirlpools within that stream. So we're just mo different modulations of consciousness. We're having individual localized experiences. When the person dies, it's like the whirlpool stops being a whirlpool. The water dissolves into the broader stream. It doesn't leave the stream. Consciousness doesn't leave the stream. The, the consciousness continues. It's simply transitioning into a new form. And this example of apparent reincarnation that we're seeing with children, it might be a reforming of a whirlpool that's using water from a prior whirlpool, to use an analogy. So it's like information is being transferred from one to the other, and it's having a manifestation both mentally, in terms of memories and preferences, but also physically. Mm. Yeah, some people say that, um, you know, the next life is formed by just randomly taking a bucket out of the stream, and then all the karma in that bucket or whatever forms this life. But I tend to think that there's a kind of a continuity from life to life, and that the the same water, so to speak, that was forming one whirlpool goes to form the next one. And we're stretching the metaphor here. But that, um, that there's, and, and I think there are traditional texts that concur with this, that there's a kind of a record kept uh, and that the soul evolves from life to life and takes advantage of progress it's made in previous lives and carries on into the next. 
Yeah, that that notion really makes sense to me now, now that I've, I've really looked at this whole area. And we think about our physical existence. We come into the body, we don't bring anything physical with us. And when we leave the body, according to this notion, consciousness continues. So the consciousness leaves the body, but we don't bring anything with us from the physical world, so to speak. All we carry with us is our consciousness and the ways in which it has evolved. So this notion that we are evolving through an infinite diversity of expression in the universe, and even on a more individualistic level as individual whirlpools that become new whirlpools, mm -hmm. it's like there is this continuity that's occurring and there is an evolution. That just seems to make sense to me based on the way that consciousness is, is transitioning uh, beyond this life. Yeah, makes sense to me. I'm happy to entertain any c contrary uh, opinions, but um, it just seems to fit, you know? It seems to fit and it's what many people report who have entered altered states when people come back from a near-death experience there is this sense that it is not the end of life and we are the life review is part of the learning and evolving process people who are uh, highly psychic whether it's through mediumship or channeling or other forms many people through independent areas hypnosis is another one they come back with this notion of uh, recurring lives in different bodies and in evolution that's sort of a continuum yeah, there's a guy named Michael Newton. You've probably heard of him. You ever yes. Read? Yeah, and he specialized in hypnotizing people back to the period between lives, and he, he got so much consistency between all of his different subjects that he was able to map out, you know, a pretty much agreed upon scenario of, of what happens when we're in between lives. Uh, and I interviewed a guy who was sort of a protege of his, or somewhat in the same vein. I forget the guy's no, name. Is it Robert Schwartz? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> But in any case, I mean, it kind of can reinforces what we're just saying here, that there's a sort of a, it's like, you know, you go from one grade to the next, so to speak, as you go through your education. And it's not like you're a whole new person when you go from seventh grade to eighth grade. You, you carry on your, your knowledge from seventh grade, and then you, you build upon it in the eighth grade, and so on. Right, right. But it is so counter to mainstream thinking, to think that way, because it's much more expansive. And it, it says that something is at play here that's beyond our genetics and beyond our environment. And that's what basic medicine says, is that our physical form and that who we are, that's informed by our genetics and our environment, and that's it. And here, there seems to be a third factor, and that's what the Virginia University of Virginia researchers say. There might be a third factor here that's influencing who we are in this body. And if that's true, think about if our medicine and science and everything else, we're missing an entire factor. Which they are. Which is which what they are. Um, yeah. And what we're saying doesn't contradict genetics or environment. Um, it, 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 it's that, you know, your karma, so to speak, would, um, you would be born into a circumstance and with, with certain genetics that would be in alignment with your karma. Yeah. Exactly. That's the way it works. We don't have to throw out the old, but it's just an incorporation of a much more expansive idea. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important point because if, if we did have to throw out the old, then, then there would be reason for all these people to be threatened and to fight back against such notions. But if, if it's more a matter of building upon what we already know and just expanding it and filling in some missing pieces, then who wouldn't want that? Right. In theory. In theory. In theory. <laughs> yeah. Huh. But I am intrigued by you know, the notion that you, I read in that paragraph at the very beginning of, of the interview that... Uh, we could actually really trace back just about every problem in the world to the fact that um, we don't regard consciousness as fundamental and that and we might add that we're not taking advantage of the fact that it's fundamental by tapping into that resource adequately. It's a very empowering idea because it means that everyone is entitled to this because it's fundamental to who and what we are. Whereas we live in a world that is much more um, hierarchical that it, it makes certain things seem to be more important than others, whereas here we're seeing an empowering notion. So I think it's, it, 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 this is why it's not just an intellectual endeavor. This is something that applies to everyone in their own life and how they carry themselves in the world and how they think of themselves in relation to others. I think this notion of separation is one that is, it's so subtle, but it's, it's, it's just part of the materialist view. It's, I am a body that emerged randomly through matter. I have my own brain, my own consciousness. And even though I see you as another human being, you have similar genetics to me because we're part of the same species and we inhabit the same universe and planet. Beyond that, we are separate beings. 
Whereas if we are part of the same consciousness and our eyes just show us an apparent separation, then the way we treat one another becomes paramount because we're all the same. And when we think about things like altruism, and that's been a big hot topic in biology, it's like, wait, how do we explain that we're, we're good to others if we're separate and we're survival of the fittest? And there are some explanations to show that it's beneficial for genetics to uh, help others in your gene pool. Mm -hmm. But we could also explain altruism through this notion that we're connected as part of the same self. And by helping another, you are actually being selfish because you're helping yourself through a, another form. And that idea alone, I mean, we think about all the problems we have on a daily, daily basis and throughout the world. I think many of them stem from this notion that we are separate from each other. Yeah. And of course, all the great religious traditions say that we're not. I mean, you know, Jesus said, whatsoever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. And the Upanishads say, thou art that, and that, you know, all this is that, and that alone is. And, um, and so there are just so many examples of people who actually were having that experience expressing it for us. Um, but, you know, if you, if you don't have, well, Jesus also used to always say, if you, if you have the ears to hear, then you'll hear. And, and pearls before swine and all that. So, but you know, a lot of people just hear these concepts and they don't mean anything because it doesn't resonate with their experience, I suppose. Right, right. Again, I think it goes back to our perceptual systems. It looks like there's separation out there. And if you, unless you've had a personal mystical experience where you felt the oneness, or unless you've really dug into this, this science, or you've had just a personal sense of it, it can be hard to absorb it. But that's, to me, it, it's important enough where I, I decided to write a book on it, and I'm now speaking publicly. These were not things that were on my radar. Yeah. I had no plans of writing a book or being public in any way, but I felt that it was important enough because, like Rupert Spira says, and I quote him towards the end of my book, he says something to the effect of, if we look back 250 years from now and see that the human species hadn't survived, it will likely be because the materialist paradigm has prevailed, meaning this notion that consciousness comes from the brain. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, a, that's a big deal. And that's worthy to me of spending time to, to talk about these topics and to write a book. Yeah, I'm placing my money on, on um, the paradigm shifting. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so you yourself, have you, um, in addition to really wrapping your head around this intellectually, have you gotten onto some sort of spiritual practice that you're doing consistently? I do. I've tried different forms of meditation. I think living a, a very contemplative lifestyle where I'm kind of pulling back to that sense of being consciousness rather than being the body mm -hmm. while living on a daily basis, mm -hmm. in addition to doing that kind of in a silent time, yeah. that's been the biggest practice for me, is that reminder of who and what I think I am now and what reality is. And then acting from that place is very different than what I used to do. Yeah. Well, maybe you're a jnana yogi. You know what that means? Yeah, so it's the intellectual path. I've, I've learned right. about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're certainly a bright guy. <clears throat> Next lifetime, I want to go to Princeton and be captain of the tennis team, or maybe the pickleball team if they have one. <laughs> maybe then they will. Pickleball is fun, like yeah. we talked about. <laughs> hey, another question came in. Let me ask this one. This is um, Aaron Morton from Dunedin, New Zealand. Um, I think that's a girl's name. Aaron asks, um, what about the observer and the observed? Do they have to happen at the same time and can't exist without the other? <laughs> what do you think comes first and how does that affect free will? I saw a cartoon the other day that said, um, I ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. I'll let you know what happens. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you, you got to ask the question. question. Yeah, yeah, I got the That's a great question. Good. Thank you, Aaron, for asking that. That gets to what is time? That's really the fundamental question underlying what you asked. Mm. Is time linear in the way that we perceive things? And is causality what we think it is? Does something from the past cause something in the future? And is time linear, past to present to future? In the book, in my book, It Ends Upside Down Thinking, and just having thought about this a lot, I think there are reasons to question our perception of linear time. We certainly perceive time to be that way, and it helps us organize things in the, in the universe. It helps us, space and time help us organize perceptions and thoughts. That's really what they are. But when we look at things like precognition, and I'll give an example of a study that I, I cite in the book. It's been replicated many times where a person is looking at an image on the computer screen. And the image is either an arousing one, like an erotic or violent image, or a very peaceful one. The body seems to respond to the image seconds before the image is randomly shown by the computer. 
meaning the person doesn't know what's going to come up. And I've actually done this test at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. You're sitting in front of a computer screen and you're just bought, you're hooked up to machines that are measuring either your skin or your eyes or your brain or your heart. Right. And, and you and end up having the researcher doesn't know what's going to come up. And even the computer doesn't know what's going to come up. It's just random. It's random. No one, no one knows because it's based on a random system. Right. And yet the body seems to have a subtle but highly statistically significant response in a direction that's consistent with the eventual picture that's shown, mm -hmm. meaning that if it's an arousing picture that comes up, the body responds in that direction before the picture is shown versus a peaceful picture like just a mountain, something that wouldn't stimulate the body. That's if there's a correlation there. So studies like that combined with many other studies of precognition, precognitive remote viewing is something that happens a lot. And I, I spoke with Russell Targ a few weeks ago. He's one of the laser physicists who ran the program, the, the US remote viewing program out of Stanford. And precognitive remote viewing is where people are remote viewing something far away in space and in time. They're seeing it before it happens. So all this is to say that our notion of linear time is put into question. And if something in a future picture is affecting the, the past of the body, is time linear? So I, I think where I come out is time is not linear in the way we perceive it. And even when we look at time from just an intellectual perspective, like many mystics have done, Rupert Spirer does this all the time. He, he says, well, think about the past. You're thinking about it right now. The past occurs now. And the same thing with the future. The future is a thought that occurs now. So I view time and space, it's kind of like this, this ever present now and here, a, a simultaneity that's occurring in a way that's almost beyond human comprehension. So th it's, then we start to, I think it, it, the humility comes back in and that's where I end up. It's like, wait, I can't, I just can't understand it. I don't know, but it's not what I perceive to be in the linear fashion that is just common sense. Yeah. I mean, Einstein told us that time is malleable and space curves and, and all that. I mean, there was, you know, relativistic time dilation, the twins paradox, one twin goes out near the spirit, speed of light and comes back. And when he gets back, his, his other twin is like really old and he hasn't aged much. So time is malleable in that way, but it's a bit more of a leap to talk about predicting or seeing things that haven't actually happened yet. It's a hard one. And I've heard lots of analogies about this, and it's kind of what you were alluding to on the topic of free will, that the future isn't fully set, but it has highly probable outcomes. And some of those outcomes are just more probable than others, and it's sort of like this distribution of potential. And if a future event is very, very likely, then maybe it can be predicted. I, I don't know. I, I, that, it's hard for me too. But the findings are suggesting, and I'll quote Je Dr. Jessica Utz, who's the 2016 president of the American Statistics Association. She was asked by, uh, by the US Congress and the CIA to examine the evidence for psychic phenomena. And she, what she says in her report, this is back in 1995, direct quote, she says, using the standards applied to any other area of science, psychic functioning has been well established. In that report, she says that precognition also appears to be real. This notion that the future is able to be known by some people beyond what chance would predict. So I'm seeing it occur over and over again. And scientists who seem to be really smart say there's an effect and it's just it's mind-boggling yeah um i interviewed a guy a few months ago named ishtar and um, he had all kinds of remarkable experiences as a child but he you know at one point had this really strong feeling that his mother shouldn't go anyplace and and he was like begging her and crying and you know don't go anyplace you gotta stay home and all this stuff and he and she went out in the car someplace and Ishtar looked to his left and a car was like inches away from their car going about 60 miles an hour, killed his mother instantly and uh, he, he was okay. But it was this really strong precognition thing. And there's lots of stories like that, you know. Lots of stories and sometimes they happen in dreams. They're known as precognitive dreams. Yeah. I mentioned a story from Dr. Larry Dossey who wrote a book called One Mind around the same idea, but he, he's personally had a, an example of a precog precognitive dream where he dreamt something that happened in the hospital where he worked. He's an MD in vivid detail. He dreamt it before and it, he couldn't reconcile that with the old world view and he ended up shifting away from materialism as a result. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, I hope this interview will help a few people shift away from materialism. If there are any people of that sort listening to this, I don't know if there are. We have a pretty selected audience here. Um, but um, yeah. But anyway, I, th I think the whole topic is as important as you think it is, and uh, it's it's really been uh, fun getting to talk about it with you for a couple of hours.
Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me on the show. I, I think even if for, for your listeners who are familiar with these topics, I have found in talking to people that it can be validating sometimes to hear that there's science to back what someone has experienced personally. And I've heard from people that they have felt just shy or timid about speaking about these topics openly. But now that there seems to be science backing what they've been through, maybe they'll talk about these topics in areas where, or social circles where previously they wouldn't have. Yeah. And it's one of those things that can build momentum until the point where it just shifts, you know, the hundredth monkey phenomenon or whatever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of times that kind of stuff happens quite suddenly. You know, there's a big shift, like the fall of the Berlin Wall or the collapse of the Soviet Union or something. You didn't see it coming and then all of a sudden the whole, uh, or a lot of things. I mean, gay marriage. I mean, uh, there's all sorts of societal shifts that kind of take, come, come quite suddenly after just percolating for a while. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. The universe seems to work in a non-linear fashion, yeah. and it, there's a theory that I reference in, in End to Upside Down Thinking called chaos theory, mm -hmm. where you have a butterfly flapping its wings in Asia, and because it, when you run the math, that butterfly flapping its wings, that minute shift in the air, ends up causing a hurricane on the other side of the planet. So that's how things seem to work, where a tiny shift, ostensibly based on our linear mind, actually has a much bigger effect, more than we can actually compute using our brain. Yeah. There's also a thing in science called phase transition, uh, and there are many examples of it, but even boiling water is one where it can be almost 212 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, maybe 211, doesn't look like much is happening, and all of a sudden it reaches 212, and boom, it starts to boil. And uh, there's all kinds of interesting analogies about how certain percentages of people shifting in their consciousness could cause the whole society to shift once a certain critical mass has been reached. I've heard that theory. Yeah, I'm very intrigued by it. I mean, I hope it happens yeah. in our lifetimes. That would be cool to see, to see a shift that way. But who knows? I think it, at the very least on an individual level, this can be extremely liberating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to say the least. There's an old Bengali saying, which is, if no one comes on your call, then go ahead alone. Um, so it's yeah. extremely li liberating and gratifying for the individual, whether or not the rest of society, you know, buys into it. That's how I felt about this whole process, is that I was going to put the book out because it really resonated with me and I wanted to give others an opportunity to take in that information without having to do the research that I did and scrounge around and find and sift through things. Mm -hmm. um, and some people won't like that, and that's, that's okay by me. I think it's, it's a matter of finding truth for ourselves. Yeah, well, the book is well-referenced, and there's, there's all, a whole you know, notes in the back with references to all kinds of things. So yours is a good kind of synopsis and then if people want to get into the details you, you point them in all the various directions right i wanted it to be an overview for the general public i didn't want it to be too scientific while not being unscientific so there are hundreds of citations in the back for people who want more detail yeah great Alrighty. so um i'll be putting up a page on bat gap with you know link to your website and a little bio of you and a link to your book and people can go there and but your website is easy to remember. It's just markgober.com, G O Mark M A R K G O B E R, and uh, people can go there, or they can bounce off of the BatGap page and uh, <clears throat> get to your site. So, thanks, Mark. I really appreciate spending the time with you. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for having me, Rick, and thanks for all the great work you do. I think these interviews are part of are helping the shift, and I, I know they've helped a lot of people. I've listened to many of your interviews over this period as well, so I want to thank you. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Um, and I'm looking forward to your podcast, by the way. I've heard you allude to it several times, and you've, you've interviewed a whole bunch of interesting people. It's going to be work very well produced, and I'll definitely subscribe to it. Okay, thank you. I'm excited for it. Yeah. Later in 2019. Good. Okay, so thanks to those who are listening, who have been listening or watching, and we will see you for the next one.